Capella Foundation and Keep America Beautiful. My name is Christine Von Kalmitz. And I'll be your moderator today. This webinar is part of our free Kurt Technical Webinar Series, which is designed to share information and perspectives about recycling. We are hosting the first Thursday from 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Today I'm pleased to be joined by two great speakers. Sheila Backen is the Integrated Solid Waste Program Manage Manager from Colorado State University, and Michael Mitchner, who is the Recycling and Waste Operations Manager from Michigan State University. And I'm sorry to let you know, but John Sheevey was also supposed to join us today, but he could not join us today due to a family emergency. So, so we're going to follow the agenda today um, with Sheila going first and then Michael following up. And we will also have uh, some polling questions. Um, and before we begin, I'd like to provide some housekeeping notes about how we'll conduct today's webinar. If you have any technical problems during the webinar, you can call GoToWebinar's customer support line at 1-800-263-6317. That's 1-800-263-6317. If you experience sound quality issues, please try hanging up and dialing back in. Because of the size of the audience, we'll be keeping the session in listen-only mode. That means all of your lines are muted, but you can submit questions to us at any time using the questions panel on the right side of your screen. Simply click the plus sign next to the word question on your control panel. Type in your question and click send. If you don't see the question box on your control panel, Try clicking on the Tools um, menu on top of the panel. Then check the question selection. You can type in a question at any time during the presentation. We'll be sure to get back to you if you have a question that we're not able to address during the program. Any other concerns you might have can be addressed by using the chat function, which is at the bottom of your control panel. Click on the plus sign, type in your chat message, and make sure to send it to the appropriate person by using the pull-down menu at the bottom of the pane. One final housekeeping note. We will be placing the slides on a recording of the webinar and a recording of the webinar on the Kirk site as soon as we can so that you can review the session or share it with your colleagues. All right, let's um, get started here. So. I think we wanted to start with a poll. So um, the first question is, are you planning to purchase a truck in the next year? You can go ahead and select yes or no. Okay, so here's the results. We've got 53% um, said yes and 47% said no. All right, let's go to the next question. All right, so if you're doing that, which type of truck do you plan on purchasing? A front end, a rear load, a side load, a roll off, or a box truck? Okay, um, 
I saw that. Okay, there it is. All right, so 34% of you are looking to buy a rear load truck. Um, and then 21% are looking at roll-offs. And box trucks is next at 17. And then we've got front-end and side load equal at 14%. So um, that's, that's a lot of trucks, and that's a lot of equipment out there. So uh, that's why we're having this webinar, and we want to get some answers about what, what's good equipment. Let's go with a couple more questions. Are you planning to purchase bailing equipment in the next year? Yes or no? All right, 24%. That's a good bit lower than the trucks. So let's go to the next one. Are you planning to purchase sort line equipment? Eleven percent there. Um, we've got three more questions. So let's go ahead and get those three in. Are you planning to purchase shredding equipment? Only eight percent there. Okay, um, next question. Are you planning to purchase dumpsters? And you've got choices of the front end, the open top, rear load, or enclosed type of dumpster for the recycling sorting. Okay, 53% of you are going to purchase the enclosed type of dumpster for sorting recycling, 20% for front end, 18% for rear load, and 10% for open top. All right, one more question. Are you planning on purchasing other processing equipment such as a forklift, a bobcat, or conveyors? All right, forty one per cent are looking at a bobcat there, and 32% are looking at the conveyors, and 27% um, are going to buy a forklift. So as you can see um, from this survey that that's in the next year. That's a lot of equipment that is going to be purchased. And um, Let's get right to um, Sheila's presentation and find out a little bit about what they've done at Colorado State. So Sheila is the Integrated Solid Waste Program Manager at Colorado State University. Among her many responsibilities are the school's day-to-day -day operations, supervision of a nine-man crew, budgeting, planning, and reporting on all areas of the recycle and trash operations. Sheila has been working at Colorado State University since 1995 and has overseen the trash and recycling service for 15 years. In fiscal year 95, the campus recycling rate was 
In fiscal year 2011, the recycle rate had increased to 71.7%. So great job, Colorado State University. And Sheila, take it away. Thank you, Christine. Um, what we started was with a half-ton truck. Um, it had a cover over it. We used to call it the covered wagon. Um, it was good for its time uh, that we had it, uh, but we quickly grew out of that. Um, and we had to look at bigger and, and better things. Um, when we were doing this, we would spend uh, half the day just filling up this truck uh, with cardboard and taking it to our storage area to unload it um, and uh, eventually bail it. Um, then we would load this truck up with cages so that we could pick up office paper or um, commingled. Uh, it was actually either bottles or cans at the time and uh, um, newspaper. After um, after a while, we wound up. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> After we we pick up all of um, all of the items that we needed to, we would take it to our storage area, and uh, we would either sort it or bale it. And we had large stacks of um, of cardboard on the floor that everybody would have to pick up and throw into this baler and, and bale it. We actually had two shifts at the time, um, so we did a lot of work with with trying to get everything sorted and everything else. And um, then we would, um, after a while, when we grew out of that truck, we decided that we needed to buy something bigger. So what we wound up doing was having a four-compartment, 16-yard truck built so that we could uh, actually pick up four different items at the same time or use the bins to pick up several different items and we could um, actually dump them um, one, one compartment at, at a time. Um, when we started using that truck we wound up, uh, <laughs> wound up not using, uh, not using the, the um, uh, sorting uh, items as much as what we used to. Um, what this slide is showing you is how our recycling areas used to look. When we first started, we would use anything we could find, 55-gallon drums, uh, cages, uh, just anything that would hold items for recycling. And then we switched over to uh, 65 and 95-gallon Schaefer polycarts. Um, and those uh, definitely were more aesthetic. Um, and made things look a whole lot better. These are the trucks that uh, we wound up buying after uh, we grew out of our, our little uh, half-ton truck. Uh, we bought a 16-foot uh, uh, cube van, or a box truck, um, and then uh, this four-compartment uh, recycle truck. Um, the 16-foot cube bin at the time cost us about $16,000. The to have the four-compartment um, recycle truck made, it was about $26,000. And we used those for about five more years until our uh, our recycling operation got bigger. As we grew, we wound up buying a very nice baler, a uh, vertical baler. I mean, uh, this one was a horizontal baler. And it, we actually had a conveyor that we could dump the uh, box truck, all of the cardboard out of it, onto a conveyor, and it would bale it as we dropped it off so we didn't have these large stockpiles of cardboard anymore. 
we had this machine for about three years until we had a very bad snowstorm. And it caved in the roof of this dairy barn that we were in and uh, landed on top of our baler. We lost our storage area. Um, and we lost uh, the baler. We had to wind up selling it after this um, because we had no place to put it anymore. Uh, they decided that they were going to knock down the uh, the dairy and uh, just make us uh, do what we can or, and actually take a look at, at what, um, what kind of items that we could recycle or if maybe we should just totally quit recycling. Um, so we had to do a, uh, an audit on ourselves and um, see how much it would cost if we landfilled everything, see how much it costs to actually recycle um, each commodity. Um, it was a very interesting process at the time. Um, After we lost our dairy, um, we wound up going single stream uh, because our, our recycling center had, um, had gotten, um, gone into single stream. They, they had um, started taking single stream from, from, uh, from us. So we bought bigger trucks. Um, we bought a 26-yard automated side loader to handle our, our single stream recycling. Uh, we also uh, eventually bought a rear load, uh, and it's only a 13-yard rear load uh, to handle all of our cardboard. Uh, these two vehicles work very well uh, for picking up the 95-gallon carts and uh, uh, for picking up cardboard. We had a lot of injuries with our cardboard because we were throwing it into the back of the 16-foot cube van. Um, so we wound up with, with a few injuries on that. The cardboard always seemed to be the biggest challenge that we had. And we also uh, found that when our trucks were down for maintenance, um, we had to find different ways to pick up everything. So that uh, what we did when we bought the rear load is we put a um, cart lifter on the back of it so that when we were picking up the cardboard, we could also pick up the uh, commingle and the office paper and newspaper and magazines and phone books and everything else and just mix it all into the truck. And instead of having two separate loads, we would take it out as one. Um, we found that we can also do that in the side load. It would empty our cardboard bin. Um, and our, our cube van went strictly for uh, deliveries and pickups of poly carts for events and office cleanouts. Um, we also pick up batteries and several other things. Um, so it was rather nice. Um, when we were able to actually separate everything out. With the changes that we made, um, things actually, uh, we wound up cutting our costs and cutting how many people were working for us because we had a day shift and a night shift um, before our dairy um, was taken away from us. So when we reorganized and got the bigger trucks, we wound up only needing a day shift uh, to pick up all of the recycle items. And taking everything to single stream made our recycling, um, made it easier for all of our, our customers. And uh, they started recycling even more, uh, which is how we kept growing. Some of the things that we did was we, we um, took a look at the different uh, carts that we had uh, in uh, 
uh, in our storage areas and, and um, outside of our buildings and inside of our buildings. Um, they started remodeling our resident ha residence halls, and they put in a cellmat pulper. What this machine does is it, it grinds up everything, all the um, napkins and forks and knives and everything else and all the food waste into a confetti and then spits it out into 95-gallon uh, bins. We actually use 65-gallon carts because the 95s got too, too heavy to move um, for to, to um, put this stuff into to take out to our compost. We also looked at um, what we were using indoors and in our classrooms. And we wound up using the slum gyms for our classrooms because we don't have a lot of room in there. Um, they put so many chairs and so many desks in there that, that they don't give you enough room to actually put um, a nice recycling area in there. So next to our trash cans, we, we put our slim gyms. Uh, for our office areas, we wound up putting uh, 28 quart uh, recycling bins so that they're as large as what their trash cans are. In our hallways, we wound up using a public square recycling um, bins, and we only use three of these bins. The largest one that they have, it, we found, is, is it's too heavy for the custodial staff to actually empty uh, in a safe manner, so we stay away from the, the tallest ones. Um, do you have any questions? Okay, um, uh, Sheila, a few questions did come in. Okay. I'll go ahead and read those. So um, the first one is, we send over 100,000 pounds of recycling a month to a facility three miles away via our dual compartment garbage style truck. One side for OCC and the other for single stream. It can send up to 9,000 pounds of material to the facility in one trip. It is getting old and repairs are averaging over $15,000 a year, but it has been invaluable. The higher ups think that it's too big and we should try to downsize, but that would require at least two smaller compaction trucks with both of them running at the same, running to the same stops every day. So, um, Sheila, do you have any suggestions? <laughs> For this well, that that is basically what we do. We have a 32-yard um, uh, uh, front load truck for our trash, and then we have the side load for our recycling. Um, there's we also went to a bag trash system, so that uh, all of our academic buildings are on a bag trash system where the custodial staff brings the trash out to the corner and we pick it up um, in our, we actually have a stake bed to pick up uh, the trash with. Um, and we do that, we have four routes a day uh, to pick up bag trash. And that eliminated over a hundred dumpsters off of our campus, which cut our costs uh, greatly because we had a lot of trash coming onto campus from off campus. Uh, people decided that they really liked our dumpsters and they wanted to use them. Um, so it, it did make a, a big difference to go to a bag trash system and uh, a dumpster system only at the housing areas and areas that we have um, uh, waste that can hurt you like glass and, and different stuff like that, lab waste. Um, so we do have two different trucks, actually three different trucks that go around the campus. Okay, great. Um, the next question is, do personnel need to have a CDL license to drive any of these vehicles? And was that a consideration when you selected your trucks? Uh, uh, the 13-yard rear load does not actually require a CDL. But we require them to have a CDL anyway because of the air brakes. Um, the only way you can get an air brake endorsement is 
by having a CDL. So uh, we decided that for safety sake, it was better to require that all of our employees um, get a CDL. Okay. Um, can you tell us who the manufacturer of your side load truck was and what it cost approximately? Yes. Um, the um, uh, side load is a bridge port, and we went with the bridge port only because it was the cheapest one. Uh, it cost us $130,000, um, and it's got a Peterbilt truck on it. Okay. And um, the lift on that, do you know it, the brand? Uh, the brand? It's a, a, a gripper um, lift on the thing. Um, as far as it all came with the truck when we ordered the Packer body uh, for it. So um, I, as far as I know, it, it just came from Bridgeport. Okay. Um, it may be a Bane, though. Um, because I know they make uh, make these lifts for the trucks. Okay, okay. And then uh, I know everybody wants to know you've got some great equipment there, and you you totally changed your whole program. Um, so where'd you get the money? <laughs> That's the big question of the day. Well, um, we've got. Um, a, an, an equipment fund within facilities, which who I work under, and uh, most of the equipment we could buy and then pay off um, over, like with the trash trucks or the recycle truck, it was over a seven-year period. So our payments were um, somewhere around twenty thousand dollars a year. Um, so are you getting paid for your recycling, and that's where you're getting the yep, money? Yeah, we get, we get paid for our recycling. Um, uh, for the single stream, we, we do get paid for it. Uh, for the cardboard, we get paid uh, uh, basically the going rate uh, for the cardboard also. And then um, like our housing areas, our federal areas, they all have to pay their own trash and recycle. So we charge them. Um, and we have enough in there that it covers buying more bins, um, repairs on trucks, and different stuff like that. And we, when we get too many, too much of a cost of repairs on trucks, we start looking at replacing them. Um, I've, right now, I've got them on a 10-year cycle, so that after 10 years, uh, we replace it. Okay. Um. How far is the single stream facility from your campus, and do you only have one single stream facility near your campus? Yes, we only have one single stream facility near our campus, and it is about, um, I'd say about 12 miles away. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you run your own in-house trash collection? Yes, we do. And let's see. So why do you use the steak body truck for bag trash and not another rear loader? Um, some of the areas that we've got to get into for, for bag trash in order to protect it from the wind um, would not allow a heavier truck on to the sidewalk. It would break through into the tunnels underneath uh, the campus, um, steam tunnels and stuff like that. Um, so we, we wound up using a... Uh, a uh, stake bed, and then we take it to a compactor, and uh, we only have to empty that compactor once every two weeks, which is phenomenal compared to what we used to do. Okay, great. Um, there are a few more questions, but uh, I think we need to uh, move on to our next speaker. And um, for those questions that we didn't get to, I uh, will. Um, I will try to answer them um, through the chat function during um, the next um, speaker, and or we will be able to get those out after the webinar um, on the Kirk webpage somehow. So um, let's move on. So uh, our next speaker is Michael Michener. He joined Michigan State University in 2000. 
as an operations supervisor in the university's housing division after serving there for four and a half years. Michael moved over to 2007. In custodial services, Mike gained his first experience with the university's recycling efforts, dealing with a small portion of the materials collected at the time, which was cardboard, newspaper, and a few plastics. In November 2007, Michael was asked to serve on an interim basis as the Recycling and Waste Management Operations Manager. In June of 2008, he was given the position on a permanent basis and charged with overseeing the launch of the university's comprehensive recycling program. Starting in April of 2008, the university set a goal of recycling five basic materials in all buildings on campus by the end of the year. Cardboard, white ledger, um, newspaper, and MOP, also plastics number one and two. In January 2010, the program was expanded to include all plastics, um, which added three through seven, boxboard, household metals, and they began their exterior recycling program. The university opened its own material recovery facility in August of 2009. Michael was put in charge to set up procedures for its operation, as well as selecting new fleet equipment, including vehicles and technology, to be used in the new operation. Since that time, new additional equipment has been added. Materials are marketed to various vendors in different ways. An in-house shred operation was added in the summer of 2011, and this spring the university will begin diverting food waste through the recycling operation. All right, Michael, take it away. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving us the opportunity to be a part of this webinar. Um, I want to go ahead and go to the first slide here. Uh, we use a variety of trucks, and our basic fleet consists of 10 to 11 trucks that run on a daily basis, two roll-off trucks, uh, two front-load trucks that uh, do trash, uh, two front-load trucks that do recycling, uh, and then two of the box trucks. Uh, that are picking up odds and ends, which we'll talk about a little bit more uh, a little later. And then also a uh, flatbed truck um, as well. Okay, go ahead to the next. Uh, we use our front load trucks to pick up um, office paper, trash, plastic, household metal, and cardboard. Uh, the truck you're looking at there um, is the Heil Half Pack. Uh, we have onboard scales with all of our trucks, which I'll talk a little bit more about a little later. Uh, but having the scale installed on the truck is now part of our spec. Um, the fitting of our existing fleet was about 13000 per truck uh, to get, get those trucks uh, up to date. Okay. Um, our roll-off trucks uh, also do a variety of things for us. We have some large self-contained compactors, as you can see in the picture here, uh, inside our, our facility. Um, that is picking up primarily cardboard, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about the other things that go into that load. Uh, we have some very large trash compactors, uh, some as large as uh, 27 yards uh, that we will haul to the landfill in some of our larger buildings. We have approximately 30 open top roll-offs that we'll use for move in and move out, as well as uh, uh, construction projects on campus and we try to divert as much of that uh, construction debris. Uh, we'll bring it here to the facility, we'll sort it out what we can. Uh, we also have a backhoe that we will then reload a roll off, uh, compact it as best we can and minimize uh, trips out to the landfill. And um, our Brody complex, a rather large uh, residential hall, installed a pulper last year and we have a large uh, roll-off self-contained unit there that we haul out to our anaerobic digester which I'll also talk about a little more in a few minutes here. Okay. Um, our new facility is a dual purpose facility. We handle the surplus items as well as all the recycling and waste items. And so we actually have two separate fleets of these service box trucks, and you can see the various items that uh, each of these routes are, are taking care of for us. 
we're in the process right now of starting to merge that operation into one um, so that we don't have a truck going to the same building, one for surplus and then a second one uh, for recycling. Uh, you know, the odds and ends is how we commonly refer to it. Okay. Uh, this is our split body truck and we do consider this uh, one of our crown jewels. It really helped us out a great deal. Uh, it's a uh, can body and it can be 50-50 and it can be adjusted to a 60-40 split. And it went into service in January uh, of 2011 and we were amazed, we were hopeful, we planned for it, and we were amazed at how efficient it made us in picking up uh, sorted white ledger mixed office paper or MOP. Um, and what the truck will do is it'll head out in the morning and hit anywhere from 25 to 35 stops um, picking up sorted white ledger and mixed office paper. It'll return to our facility, uh, dump those two separate loads, and then head right back out and hit the same 25 to 35 stops and it will pick up all plastic and newspaper and then return to the facility and unload those. So it has really, really helped us quite a bit. It allowed us to use our service trucks to expand our collection of toner cartridges. Uh, we've got a glass program going on campus now, uh, fluorescent tubes, uh, do more with office cleanouts, uh, and our service trucks will be handling the food waste. Uh, which is starting this month, uh, in fact, just next week on a, a much larger scale basis. So we also, um, well, I'm going to wait and talk about our shredding service a little more in a, in a later slide. So uh, the, the truck was expensive at $271,000, but eliminating two and a half routes on campus uh, really made a big difference for us. Okay. Some of the new technology that we've put into place is uh, all of our trucks, uh, the front load trucks, have a onboard scale. We use a Vulcan V600 model. Um, it allows us to collect data by building um, what we're picking up. We've uh, just developed a software program using iPads, uh, using a FileMaker database to where as the drivers are picking up these loads, they're instantly putting it in, it comes back to the server, so we can see everything in, in real time. Uh, we also have the ability that should someone call during the day uh, with a special service request, um, we can push that out to the iPad uh, immediately, and the driver has the ability to alter his route and take care of anything that needs to be done out there in, in the field. Uh, we're going to be using the same technology in our surplus program, and that software is currently being developed uh, as well. Okay. Uh, some of the new processes that have helped us out, uh, what you're looking at there is a full-size truck scale that's part of the, the new facility here. Uh, the capacity on that is 200,000 pounds. And one of the things we did uh, was just watching the weight tickets come in and we set a goal for the drivers that they would not go to the landfill until they had uh, 20,000 pounds of trash in their truck. We did get some pushback from the crew at first uh, when we did that. They were used to dumping their truck twice a day regardless of how much was in there. Uh, but we just wanted to gain some efficiency, so we put this goal in place. Uh, after a couple months, uh, all the drivers got used to the routine and they are the ones that actually started monitoring it themselves and they have pushed us up over the, the 22,000 uh, pounds before a truck will go to the landfill. And we had calculated some time ago that not including the tipping fees but just the cost of sending the driver out to the landfill and the maintenance on the truck was about $60 per trip and we were spending $86,000 a year uh, just going to the landfill to dump and we've been able to cut a third off of that uh, just by using these new tools that, that we're fortunate enough to have. Okay. Uh, we talked about food waste, I mentioned it briefly. The Brody Complex is generating the 10 to 12,000 pounds of pulp material that's both pre and post uh, material 
and we are taking it out to the university's anaerobic digester. Uh, the digester also takes a number of materials from across campus. Um, it's still in its research phase right now, and it's a 250,000 gallon tank. And the plans are, as things keep going forward, to roll this out for all of the campus uh, housing units, of which there are 26. Uh, we also have our student organic farm that they're taking pre-consumer waste. Uh, and it's right now at about 1,500 pounds a week. And it's those two programs that we are going to be expanding next week. Uh, what we've done is, through Cascade, purchased, uh, oh, to start with, 54. 65-gallon uh, carts and 35-gallon carts. Um, and they have a little locking mechanism on top that just takes a, a pin to push through to make sure these things don't tip over and create a bigger mess for you. So we're going to start rolling that out next week, and our goal is to, by fall semester, have the entire campus up and running on, on this program. Okay. Um, this is a shot that we looked at before, but I wanted to put it in again. Uh, we use what's uh, considered a co-mingled, a strategic co-mingled recycling system here. And because, as probably everyone is, has this issue, you only have so much space, we've just decided to put certain materials together. When you look at our recycling bins in the hallways, you will see plastic and tin uh, in the same bin. You will see the mixed office paper and box board in the same tent or same bin. Um, and there are other things like that that we will be, be doing as we continue to, to grow the program. One of the things that this has done for us is that we can change when we sort. And I'll show you a shot of our sort line in a moment. Uh, but based on market price, uh, for instance, there are times we will sort our box board out of the mixed office paper Generally, that's going to happen when uh, sorted office paper <laughs> climbs over $200 a ton. Uh, then we will go ahead and sort that material and take the higher price. And then we also send out a low-grade mixed paper that generally we've been receiving uh, $80 to $90 a ton. So uh, on our cardboard, because we have a baler, which you'll see in a moment, uh, we are actually mill direct right now on our cardboard pricing as well as uh, our sorted white ledger. We also sort all of our different plastics out. We sort out number ones, natural number twos, colored number twos. Uh, we've just started sorting uh, number four, the, the bags, and we still co-mingle three fives and sevens. Um, and that co-mingled bale, we found a processor local about 20, maybe 25 miles away from us. And we're getting three cents a pound for all of that co-mingled plastic, which is not a lot, but it's better than putting it in the landfill, of course. So uh, our other plastics, we've been able to raise our average price uh, in the summer of 2011 for all plastics before we started sorting. We were only getting a penny and a half a pound, and right now we've pushed that up to 12, 13 cents a pound for all plastics. So we feel like it's paying off for us to go ahead and sort the plastics, okay? Uh, most of our residential halls and several of our other large buildings have front load compactors. We use them both for cardboard and landfill material. And the pricing just varies based on which options you decide to go with and how big uh, you want the compactor to be. Um, Generally speaking, the housing folks like to have a cart tipper for trash, uh, but we will forego that for cardboard or other recyclable materials that are a little lighter. Okay. On our docks, uh, we have so many different sizes of docks. We have uh, just a myriad of different carts that we use. Uh, some of them have been on campus for 20 years. Um, in the last three years, we've not had to purchase any standard curb carts other than for our new programs in which we will go to a different color uh, or get a food waste one that's completely sealed up. So there's no end to the, the list of things. We've tried to stay as flexible as we could so that we could meet the needs of the campus. All right. Um, we found that these bush system containers have worked very well for us. They're very similar to a uh, Slim Jim. 
Uh, but when we were ready to purchase 3,000 of them uh, a couple years ago, we sent it out to bid, and for $40 per container, uh, this was our best option. Uh, when we purchased the 3,000, we probably actually only needed 2,500 or so right then, uh, but we've already gone through an additional 200, and in the next year or two, we suspect we will wind up using all of them. Uh, we go with the standard five-piece setup, but some of these stations may have as many as six to ten slots. Uh, we're very conscious of certain locations where you may have a large lecture hall and two to three hundred kids coming out at once, and you need to make sure that you're not bottlenecking things. Uh, so these containers are all over campus. Some are in the built-in stations, uh, as you see there. Okay. Our exterior recycling program um, got off to a rough start, but we've kind of changed it. We originally tried to have it monitor what was going on inside the buildings, and we just discovered that it's a different animal when you're outside. So we're kind of going to a dual stream uh, approach, where all containers will go in one. Um, anything that's uh, fiber will go in a second, and then the third piece will be a trash can. So when you look at the picture on the left there, in most cases there will be a standard outside trash can near uh, a container like that. Um, the containers on the right um, are metal. Uh, when they first came in, they looked really nice. To be honest with you, we're, we're not real pleased with them. And of course, there's not a lot of flexibility uh, to change those. So we've got a tough decision to make uh, with those units. Okay. Uh, this is a shot of our MRF. Uh, that is a Harris Baylor Badger model. Uh, it's capable of 3,600 psi. Um, I'm sorry, 4,000 psi. We generally only run up to 3,600. Uh, and then Carl Schmidt put in the, uh, well, they installed both the Baylor and the sort line for us. Uh, the whole facility, uh, MRF, if you will, uh, is 18,000 square feet has large 24-foot door so that we can bring all of our big trucks right inside uh, and dump on the floor. As you can see there, the surplus and recycling center facility was $13.3 million uh, to build, and the Board of Trustees were kind enough to approve that, and it's our jobs now to meet the building payback and, uh, <laughs> and get everything taken care of. Uh, this is a, a shot. Um, those bottles coming down the line are after one of our football games where they've gone through the stands and picked up all of the bottles. Um, and we throw that into an open top roll off and then it will come back here and we use student labor to sort that. Typically uh, from our first three or four football games here in Michigan when it's still relatively warm, we will get anywhere from 30 to 40 yards of plastic out of the stadium. And of course, that drops off you know, as, as the lovely snow starts to fly. Okay. Some of the different equipment that we have here, uh, that's a diesel bobcat that we use to push the material around inside the MRF. Uh, we have two forklifts. One's a propane, one is electric. That flexibility lets us uh, keep moving when we have to do different things. Uh, we try to have two operations running at all times inside the facility. Um, we added the shredder. Uh, it's a Beco, Beco plan shredder. Uh, it was approximately $75,000 uh, to get that installed. We used to send out our shred uh, to an outside organization and we would pay them to come and pick it up and then of course they got the value of the paper. Uh, so we went ahead and installed this after the facility was built, and the payback on that will be two to two and a half years. Uh, we will have that paid for, and one of the things we were able to do is there is a Michigan State Federal Credit Union that is loosely affiliated with the university, and we were able to pick up their shred service, and that is approximately 40,000 pounds of paper per month. Uh, so that will help us quite a bit. Uh, you can see the forklift there tipping, and that looks like one of the five-yard cans. 
we will store those underneath the sort line when we're running certain types of sorts. And then what it's dumping into that you can't see there is a large 40-yard compactor. So that's actually what we're doing right now with our, uh, our number four plastic bags. We're pulling all of those out during the sort and we will fill this 40-yard compactor and then just dump that back inside and send it straight to the bale line. Um, and so we're trying to get as many of the different plastics away from that three cents per pound uh, price level and, and just increase our revenue. Okay. Uh, we also have a rather large public drop-off center across the street from the facility and our vice president was kind enough to put the bill for that out of his, his own budget. Uh, right now we have a total of 13 containers out there, 12 of them being uh, large roll-off containers, and you can see the materials that we, we collect there. We also have a book bin uh, at one end of, of the facility, and the community fills that up two to three times a week. Uh, and as you can see, we have uh, an information station out there where we can communicate uh, with our customers. And then the donation bollard that you see there, um, we put that in. And so far, people have been kind enough to donate $2,000, just their pocket change and their bills. And we certainly appreciate that as well. Okay. One of the things that we're also doing right now to try to increase recycling uh, on campus because we know 35 percent of what we're hauling to the landfill right now is still recyclable but getting everybody on board to do the right thing uh, we still have some work to do there and so we have this mini basket program we ran it in a few pilot buildings and uh, we went ahead and, and did our first large classroom and academic building uh, just about a month ago and our goal is to sometime this summer have 10 buildings on campus and we know it's going to take us uh, approximately two to two and a half years to cover all 150 buildings that are here on campus. Okay. okay. And what we do with this program is that we will go in and we have a little demonstration. We hand out little guides to everyone uh, showing everything that we do take here on campus. Um, we have samples of everything that we carry from meeting to meeting with us. And then we have all of the props that you see here. Uh, and it was very important, we felt, to make sure people sitting in their offices could make themselves comfortable with their level of recycling, to make them uh, more in control of it, especially those that are not green although the university is committed to it, uh, you do get some pushback from some of the different staff on campus. And so we found that a lot of people, once they see you don't have to have four pieces, you, you know, you can cut it all the way down to two, uh, they get more comfortable with the program. Uh, and one of the things we do with the program is that their standard trash can goes away. Right now in our custodial services department, empties their trash every night, as well as taking care of all the recycling. Uh, well, with this new program, if somebody really doesn't want to recycle, then they're going to be responsible for taking their trash to the dock. So that's kind of motivation for a lot of people to get with the program. And are there questions? Oh, yes, there are. Um, Michael, that is a fabulous presentation and um, great program. Um, and we've got a comment here that says, awesome operation. How big is the staff? How much garbage does MSU landfill a year? Okay. Um, the staff itself, and I'm going to quote figures that are both surplus and recycling, uh, and full-time staff in the building, we have about 35 individuals. We also employ students here, so at any given moment we might have 30 to 40 students. Some will work on the sort line, others will work in the surplus area. And right now for fiscal year 1011, um, tons we took to the landfill, 7,135. And we know 35% of that shouldn't have gone to the landfill, or roughly 2,500 tons. Uh, and that's what we're after next. What's in that 2,500 tons? 
Uh, we know there's some cardboard, there's a lot of plastic, there's some tin, and there's office paper. That's what makes up most of that 35 percent. Did you do a way sort to find that out? We have done several. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, uh, that's what I was thinking. I just wanted to make sure. So um, for small schools, does it make more financial sense to contract out the waste and recycling hauling to landfills and recycling facilities? I think I lost you, but I'm hoping you can hear me. I, um, I heard most of the question, I believe. Okay, uh, do you want me to repeat it? Yes, please. Okay, it says for small schools, does it make more financial sense to contract out the waste and recycling hauling to the landfill or recycling facility? Hmm. That, that is a tough one, um, and I, I think a lot of it's going to depend on, on your local market. Um, up until this new facility opened in 2009, we were using a private recycler, and it, it was not profitable for us at all. Um, they also handled all of our landfill material. Uh, the trucks are expensive. We, we used to replace a truck every two years out of our reserve equipment fund. Just a certain percentage every year would go into that fund. Uh, with this new facility, we stopped that. But to really try to get back to your question, I'm, you just have to measure the the, the cost, all of our drivers are CDL, it's a requirement of, of the job, um, and if you can run the numbers for your local market, uh, that's where you're going to find your answer. Um, so we had the question about how much you landfilled. Did you say how many tons you um, recycled? The total recycling, hang on. See, I've got it broke down by all the different materials, but we are very close to a 50-50 breakdown when you look at everything the facility touches. I'm sorry, I don't have just the recycling number, but I've got probably 13 different categories here of what we do. <laughs> okay, okay. That's great. Um, well, maybe we can get that later and um, put it out there. So um, how did um, you pay for all your equipment? You know, that's the, again, the big question of the day. Um, well, for years, the waste removal was general funded by the university. Um, and our housing division, uh, they are not part of the general fund equation. So they pay for their waste removal uh, from their 26 facil facilities. Um, and so we started building up a um, equipment reserve and then started launching different programs. Um, when we merged with the surplus operation, they, are, they were a standalone operation. They were self-funded and did a great job of just building it uh, based off of the material that they received. And they sell everything from the large farm equipment and cars that are here on campus to the smallest throwaway trinket. And interesting, the interesting thing about that is that they actually make more money off of the little throwaway items. Um, so Surplus was able to do a great deal in that way. Um, and then, of course, the, the big chunk of it uh, was the bond sell for the, uh, the facility to be built. Um, but at this point, we still receive some general funds uh, for waste removal. And even though we're driving that number down, uh, we had a goal to reduce it by 30% uh, by 2015. Uh, we're already at 36 37%. And what the university is doing at this point is they're allowing us to maintain our existing funding, and we're using that money to keep growing the program. I hope great. that answers the question. <laughs> that sounds great. And um, since that's such a big question today, um, I'll just throw in there that um, the program that um, we run at MUSC, that's, that's funded um, mostly by direct charge for the service. So every recycling bin that we go to, whether it's plastic, aluminum, batteries, paper, each individual item that we touch is a charge. So that's, you know, 
yet a third way to pay for this. <laughs> or fourth or fifth way to pay for this. So there are all different ways, and we also get the revenue, too, and that helps. So, how do you track um, that? How do we track that? We Well, we have a um, handheld device that we scan all the paper and file and can bin, and um, we have a, a work order system that people call in and um, request. Another question for you, Michael, is do students have direct access to the compactors at residence halls? No, they do not. Um, the general students, they have various recycling rooms uh, by floor in their halls where there are uh, containers such as a Rubbermaid brute container. They deposit everything there and then the staff, some of them mean student staff, but then the staff handles it. Uh, either down the chute and then out onto the dock and to the compactors. Okay. Um, so, Michael, your question to me about um, how we track it, did you hear my answer? I heard part of it, and then it was, you know, it, it cut out for a little bit there. Okay. Um, I'll just um, repeat the answer real quick. So, um, what I said was we track everything by uh, handheld device, and then we scan all of the bins that we go to, paper, plastic, and glass, and that sort of thing. And then we have a work order system, and people call and request services, and we keep track of who calls and who we need to charge that way. Okay. Okay. All right, so um, the next question for you, Michael, is, um, is the labeling on the interior bins done by the factory, or do you do the de decaling yourself? For the containers that you saw that were in what we call our centralized stations out in the hallways and underneath the cabinet, we did that ourselves. On the mini basket, that is uh, hot stamped in uh, to the container. Okay, at some, um, at some point during your presentation, you were talking about your exterior bins, and you said you weren't pleased with them. Um, can yeah. you explain why you're not pleased with them? Well, it's, it's not so much not pleased with the bins. I think we started our program in the wrong direction, trying to mirror what the collection uh, routine was inside the building. Uh, and then that one shot of the container that was to the right, uh, that is metal. It's a very nice looking container uh, and then the graphics were cut into the container. Well, once we started looking at adding new materials and changing the program, uh, we found out it would be over a thousand dollars to change that door uh, and that's just too costly. The other containers, you know, for probably five to ten bucks per container, we can completely change the sign and do anything we want to do. Okay, um, so one of your slides showed a conveyor belt with a whole bunch of bottles on it. And a question came in and it says, how do you handle the liquid in those bottles? <laughs> okay. You're laughing. That must be yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, first of all, the equipment is built to a standard that it does not harm the equipment at all. Uh, it does get a little messy. There's all sorts of sugars from every imaginable thing that, that comes that way. Um, we give the students uh, gloves and an apron if they would like. Uh, most of the students that work for us, obviously, they're very green and very committed to it. Uh, so they wear the gloves and, and they deal with the mess. Uh, we have three sanitary uh, drains in, in the facility. And we do not empty any of the liquid. If some spills out along the way, so be it. And once we're done baling plastic, yes, there's a big puddle on the floor by the baler. <laughs> and we just wash it down the sanitary drain. Okay, great. And um, a follow-up to that would be, um, what about bees or bugs? Because you mentioned sugar. Yes, we have not had a problem. Um, one of the things that we have that I did not put in the presentation is we have a, um, a small bay to wash out carts, so especially with the food waste we're going to be dealing with, that will be important. 
but we've kept all the pests away by installing a knockout fogger system. I believe the cost on that was just about $2,000. I was a private guy who sells a great product. Um, and even though the ceiling at certain places out in our facility is 40 foot high, it's, you know, we've got the, the lines running all over the place and it's on an automatic timer and three times uh, during the night the whole place is fogged and we've not had a problem with any insects at all. Of course, occasionally the mice will still come in, but with any warehouse they would do that. Uh, but we really have not had a problem to speak of at all with that uh, knockout fogger system in place. All right, great. All right, a um, few more questions here. So uh, what is the brand of your shredder? I believe it's pronounced VicoPlan. Okay, VicoPlan. Yeah, if anyone wants to email me, I can ship you the details, including the specs on that. All right, and then um, what type of receptacle do you use in your football and baseball stadium? And can you tell the size and the price? Okay. Um, we, again, we are flexible. We have a choice. Um, if you refer back to that slide of our exterior recycling containers, the Phoenix, it's a waste-wise double Phoenix container. Uh, it's the black one in the picture there. Uh, we have those at the soccer, softball, track, and baseball stadiums. Uh, one side for trash, the other side for recyclables. Uh, and I believe with the options we went with, you're looking at about $1,900. Uh, that will include your graphics. Um, and the interior bins, whether you want two or four uh, inside the actual bin. Uh, at our football stadium, we have another type of bush system container. We have 120 of them, and I did not include a picture of that, but it's a 45-gallon container. We've tried a couple different openings. We have those not only at football, but at basketball. And during the basketball season, we just turned it into more of a single stream unit, took the top off of it, put a small Slim Jim next to it for the trash, and that's what we do at basketball now. And we're going to try that next fall uh, for the football, but that's going to be a big test going from a 13,500-seat basketball arena to a 75,000-seat uh, football stadium. We've got some other ideas, things we're going to try, but that's what we're doing right now. Okay. How many front-load trucks do you operate, and who's the manufacturer? We have a variety of manufacturers. Um, the last one that we purchased, which went into service in January of 2011, that is a 44-yard auto car chassis with a Heil half pack. Uh, that particular truck at 44 yards can actually hold over 30,000 pounds of trash. That is our main trash truck, runs five days a week. Our other trash truck um, is an auto car chassis with a I believe it's Labrie body on it. I believe it is a 2007. Uh, it is a standard 40-yard truck, and it actually only runs on Monday and Friday. Um, and all of our trucks are somewhere between a 2002 and the 2011. As I said, there's different manufacturers for the uh, the bodies, but we've basically stuck with Auto Car for the chassis. Great. Um, so how does the pulper handle plastic flatware and other food court contaminants? They do not put the plastic through the pulper. Um, Yay! <laughs> <laughs> uh, especially because all of our pulp material is going to the anaerobic digester. Um, it's, it's food and fiber material only that runs through our pulper. Great. Great. And, um, are your collection totals posted on your website? Collection by commodity? Um, probably. Hmm. Um, no, I don't think that's on the website. Yeah. Quite yet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> it seems there 
there seems to be some desire to find that out. So, um, yeah, I think your program is so extensive that I think everyone wants to know everything about it. Um, you know, that it, it's... Well, one of the things that folks can do is send an email to uh, recycle at msu.edu. Um, and any questions that they've got, we can be happy to respond. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, my supervisor's in the room with me, and she's handing me a, a conference agenda. <laughs> uh, it's on the surplus side of things, the uh, University Surplus Property Association. So, Christine, I've, I've sent this information to the Kirk website before. I just kind of wanted to refresh anyone's memory that it's March 18th through the 21st. It's here. We'll have tours. Michael will be giving a specific presentation for what goes on in the MRF and equipment, um, but also showing um, others that, that surplus, the reuse and the recycling do go hand in hand to support one another. Um, when you were talking about, you know, how does recycling pay for itself, at one point there were some subsidies going from surplus to help recycling. Uh, that's not so much the case anymore, but but understand is that what our conference is about is that how the two work together, not only under one roof, but also how we support each other's functions with equipment, with processes, and how we hope to even look at additional synergies uh, as we move forward. So if anyone is interested, the uh, website for the conference information is www.universitysurplus dot org. So I put my two cents in. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Ruth. Everyone, that was Ruth Dowst, very talented Ruth Dowst. Um, and that you did answer um, the two questions that just came in. Um, everyone wants to know about the tour, how to get a tour, and um, if Michael was going to be at the property conference. So great. Um, so we will. Um, we can get that information out again by Recycle. Um, if you'd like, I can resend that um, the link and our absolutely. information for the conference. Absolutely, I think there's definitely some um, desire to see that. So great. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Um, really, thank you to everyone who asked questions and everyone who answered the polls. Thank you, Sheila and Michael. Your programs are fabulous, and um, we've got a lot of great information today. And um, thank you to Larry Kaufman at Keep America Beautiful and Abigail Sprague um, for helping with all the technical and background um, setup for the um, webinar. And also thank you to the Alcoa Foundation. And um, we are going to have our um, next webinar. It will be um, Recycling Education and Awareness, Tools, Tips, and Ideas for Campus and Community Outreach, and that will be Thursday, May 10th from 1 to 2.30. We hope you can join us um, at that time. Um, we really appreciate everyone being here today, and uh, hope you have a great afternoon.